Dennis Act playoffs. Suddenly, we have a regional power as a swim program as we capture the MVP honors for both girls and boys. An undefeated league regular season for both girls versus varsity lacrosse and varsity baseball left our community spellbound this past spring. Coffee houses, model UN, drama clubs, math teams, the vibrancy of life in the margins of Burbank Academy has never been stronger, and our students have never been even more proud. Two unique leadership challenges confronted me during your particular journey. First, I will never forget leaving our Diaz team in Jackson Library with our trustees for a detailed conversation about school governance. Emerging from that front doorway of Jackson Library, I began a leisurely stroll back to early days and thinking that the end was suddenly in sight of this whole accreditation gate. I noticed a bit more screaming and giggling from our middle school students than normal, and there, perched rather contently within the confines of the Ridgeway Outdoor Classroom, sat our newest cuddly visitor and safety fight, a.k.a. In my moment of leadership brilliance, I simply did this. I started walking to Burley Davidson, then back to the library, then back to Burley Davidson. I found myself calling 911, sending a few garbled messages over our speaker system, and the bear cub went for a jaunt right across Fog Field, leading to squeals of fearful delight from J.D. Girl Soccer. A bear cub, you see, is one of the few school safety threats that is, in fact, so deep that all of you want to get closer to it. <laughs> and your head of school simply kept looking to the woods, searching for mom and bear. And when I got through to 911, I received just a sense of grounding and clarifying direction that I needed. Yes, sir, we know there is a bear cub growing in South Carolina. Well, what do you recommend I do? It's embarrassing. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> and while I thought this might be the story of the year, of course, it's far from it. In just a few minutes, you'll see my most professional and unflappable assistant, Mr. Beer, award a well-deserved diploma on this very stage. And she has so many discreet ways of knocking on my door and moving people along. But on one particular February afternoon, I heard not a normal knock, but something a bit more urgent, more like this. <laughs> yes, Colleen. Well, you see, there's a fire in the theater. <laughs> like a real fire? <laughs> well, apparently the curtain has gone in flames. <laughs> and so our journey to Little Theater began. And while there are aspects of that experience which may feel comical now, I should not minimize the bravery and courage of the actors and the adults who so adeptly dealt with the crisis, dropped the fire curtain, and left the building in relative calm. Suddenly, both our fire and our fire curtain, believe it or not, became national news. Heads of school from California were emailing me with stories from the AP wire, and I had 12 messages on my voicemail from cleanup services before I even got back to my office. <laughs> the story does have a happy ending, as you all know. The welcoming neighborly gesture of Marshall High School, the incredible flexibility of our upper school faculty, and then the performance against which all others will be measured in the future. My tears first came forth during Pat's rendition of I Dream a Dream, but found myself actually looking to charge the stage and stand in the foxhole when the revolutionary flag began waving at the end of Act One in the days. And separate from the triumph of it all, the experience of the is spoke to the power, the caring, the intimacy, the flexibility, and the joy of a community that is as special as ours. And I hope that I might be proven right that it will be the story of any reunions to come. For my part this year, I found myself with an unexpected opportunity to attend a two-week fellowship at Columbia University at Teachers College with 18 heads from around the globe. And having applied to this program the previous May looking for a chance to pursue some work about collaboration and 
teacher professional development, I really didn't know what to expect. One thing the experience showed me was how much I missed the laughter, the energy, the effort of this community and these seniors while I was gone. But the most powerful part of the fellowship experience was a chance to read some of the great educational philosophers and ponder what this whole education racket is all about in the end. We plod along on our commendable march towards AP results and college placement, but what are we really trying to accomplish? I decided to share a few quotes from these philosophers today in the hopes of showing you how they changed me. In particular, as I sat around with this group of heads from Thailand to Singapore to Australia, I realized that these philosophers were more closely aligned with our precious mission of virtue and useful knowledge at Berwick Academy than any other school represented at that table. In considering concepts of useful knowledge, the great John Dewey spoke to me deeply as he said, the educational end and the ultimate test of the value of what is learned is its use and application in improving the common life of all. There is no greater egotism than that of learning when treated simply as a mark of personal distinction to be cherished for its own sake. What I love about this school above all else is that it combines excellence with humility. It does so right back into our rather daunting motto of the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom that's stamped across our school seal. And as you move forward to a list of colleges that represent the pinnacle not only of our country but the world, do not lose sight of the two tenets in Dewey's words. None of this education stuff really matters unless you do something to make the common life of everyone better. And while you're at it, don't let your astonishing success go to your head. You will find, as I did somewhere in my mid-twenties, that you'll emerge from a list of prestigious, school, <laughs> prestigious schools suddenly as just another guy looking for a job. And it will likely be a tough time for most of you, quite probably a harder transition than the one you face now. As you begin to intersect a sense of meaning and purpose with the practical realities of being on your own and perhaps being a family. But as you did in the case of Glenn is this year, you will rise up and triumph as you have been infused with this combination of Berwickian excellence. <laughs> the most powerful philosopher I read regarding the notion of virtue was Michel de Montaigne, a French statesman and philosopher from the 16th century. In his essay on education, he speaks to the complex nuance and challenge of the ideal teacher. He suggests that virtue, in fact, is the ultimate goal of the educated soul. He says it this way. Her aim is virtue, which is not, as they teach in schools, perched on the summit of a steep mountain, rough and inaccessible. The tutor will then be teaching the student a new lesson. What makes true virtue highly valued is the ease, usefulness, and pleasure we find in being virtuous. So far from it being difficult, children can be virtuous as well as adults, the simple as well as the clever. There is no class rank, nor valid for for virtue at Burrow Academy. And there is no college result that somehow validates the degree to which you have absorbed this aspect. Rather, virtue is something you all leave us with as the most important part to guide you through the life that lies ahead. Your presence here has improved the concept of virtue that you have left in your way. And this is the reason why your work here and your parents' deep investment in it is for an outcome that is so much deeper than mere academic excellence or college acceptance. It is about sending you off with a moral promise that will gradually change the world for the better, one mind at a time. There's one final quote that I read during my time on the Upper West Side of Manhattan this year that moved me above all others. I immediately circled the word graduation in the margin of that particular night in February when I read it. And it's Dewey's attempt to explain the noble, I will call a spiritual task of the teacher, the educator, perhaps to have school as well. I will read it slowly as it's readily the lies. It's in 
say. The great problem of the educator is to see intellectually, to feel deeply the forces moving and beyond as possibilities, as signs and promises, and to interpret them in the light of what they mean. My only hope is that you, our graduates, feel as if we, your teachers, have done this for you in some small way. I hope that through a combination of intellectual knowledge and emotional empathy, we have viewed you truly as 71 individual promises for the future, all uniquely special and worthy of our best efforts. We have tried our best to interpret each of your best strengths and possibilities. And I, for one, find the light of what you may become nothing short of inspiration. You were loved at this school, and it is extremely difficult to say goodbye. But the inherent sadness in this ceremony is dwarfed by a sense of possibility and excitement we all anticipate in your next collective chapter. Thank you for making us a better school. I leave you with a final send-off from my friend, Mr. Montaigne, who said, my people will not say this lesson. We will do it. And as Hobbes Bell will not ring for you today, it's time to keep this most important of Hobbes.
Here on the hilltop, we have weathered more storms in the 1950s and went into a parallel sentence structure. We faced superstorms, firestorms, storms, BD storms, power surges, earthquakes, and there's just never on fair tasks. <laughs> on a larger scale, our community has weathered the losses of several of our own. We have mourned with the rest of the nation tragedies in Oklahoma, in Connecticut, and in right in our backyard, Boston. We have followed and prayed with bated breath over violence and tension in the Middle East and the Korean Peninsula. And what strikes me most powerfully as the magnitude of this past year crashes back over me is that our class has managed to emerge from it all. We have succeeded. We have held fast to our ideals and our relationships with each other and have seen our community through. In such a time of sustained darkness and negativity, we have found moments of beauty, grace, and success. Immediately, I'm reminded of a quote that has come from me anyway to represent uh, that all that our class and community has achieved and experienced this past year. I first discovered the words in a note written to me by our own Ms. Anger, one of our middle school English faculty, who to this day I credit with teaching me how to write, so thank you. After opening night of uh, Lynn's Rob, written on a small piece of cardstock in Ms. Anger's own hand, where these words from French author Albert Camus. In the midst of winter, I finally discovered that there was in me an invisible summer. How powerfully do those words now resonate with me as I look back on all that the class of 2013 has accomplished this year. As I consider all that we've been through and all the greatness we've been able to achieve, my friends, and yet we did it. We made it. We have emerged into the sunshine. The sunshine. Please join me 
and welcoming Zane Elmore and Andrew Patton. Gives to this 
place. Today I finally get to look him in the eye and say publicly that you are the man. Please join me in congratulating our 2013 3D Award winner, Mr. Tim Black.
67 will allow you Mr. Conquano's amazing story and deep detail of his journey in building a functional window to offer power and ultimately all kinds of sustenance to his local village. He did this with only materials from a local scrapyard and very little in the way of formal education as a young man. His story spoke to the Berg Academy community on a number of levels. As we launch a more legitimate conversation at this school of diversity, his is a truly international tale that exposed us to a world completely different than our own. And as this school continues to work harder at becoming sustainable, green, William's story is one of environmental preservation as well. But as educators, his story also challenges us about what education really is in the end. Perhaps this was the most compelling thread for me personally. His journey, by definition, challenges what skills are the ones that really matter in life, and whether or not they're even taught in formal school. He's a living embodiment of the useful knowledge that we espouse in our nation. Of all else, this man has been blessed with an intrinsic urge to persevere, and therefore is a model to all of our graduates today. William first sprung on the national scene as a speaker at a TED conference in 2007. Since then, his story has garnered international acclaim. Most recently, Dartmouth College has been a beneficiary of his work, where he's working towards a degree in environmental science and engineering. From what I hear, he's making up for lost time in the world of formal education extremely quickly. Most importantly, I want to thank him for making a gracious exception to his typical schedule to be with us today. We hope that he's been enjoying some of his Berwick Academy classmates at Dartmouth, but even more so, we hope he enjoys his time with our graduates today. Please join me in welcoming our commencement speaker, Mr. William Kampong. Thank you. 
at that day. They will tell me, I'll take some notes from them and continue studying. One day, when I went to the library, I found this book called Explaining Physics. The card picture of the movie on the cover. When I opened inside, they say movie pump water and generate electricity. I thought that if I had been able to make this movie pump water, I had been able to solve the problems that we are facing, the harder problems. I thought that by making that movie, I would be able to pump water for irrigation, growing crops two to three times a year instead of only one time. So I thought that was the uh, good idea to solve the problem that I, I was facing. But the challenge was that at that time, I didn't have any money to buy materials to build uh, my own. So what I ended up doing was to go to the junkyard to look for the materials to build my, my own. It was very really challenging when I was doing that. A lot of people were laughing at me, they thought that they, I'm going to some of them, they are saying that maybe I'm smoking weed. <laughs> I, I remember my mom was so worried of me. She thought that maybe I'm not going to get married because no one get, want to get married to a crazy man. <laughs> Regardless of all the challenges that I was facing, I didn't stop doing for what I wanted to do. Because one thing that encouraged me and said, if this movie will exist in this group, then it means that somebody, somebody else did it before. So if somebody did it, there's something that cannot stop me from doing the same thing. So I decided that like, to continue working on the project until I was able to success to build my first movie. But instead of building the movie to come forward, I ended up building the movie to generate electricity. Because at that time, I couldn't find right materials to use to build a water pump. But I had some knowledge how it would be able to generate electricity. Because when I was that young, I started getting like new curiosity about how, how different things work. I remember. At some point, I thought that inside the radio, there is not anything who speaks. <laughs> One day, my parents went away. I was like, this is a good chance for me to say hi to the people. <laughs> <laughs> I opened it, but I was also glad to see the very tiny things that looks like things out of my eyes. Being a kid, there was only one way to tell. I was like, I'm just going to pinch one of these new eyes. There are people that be screaming in my neighbors. <laughs> but they didn't scream. So from there, I started trying to learn how to fix radios. And when I was able to do that, most of the time when I'm fixing radios, I was using batteries to do, to do the work. But it was hard for me to, to buy batteries to use because we didn't have electricity. And then I ended up getting interested to learn and understand how electricity can be delayed. So some of the books that I was finding at the library, they had very good diagrams and pictures that were explaining well what things, how are you be able to generate electricity. Even though at that time I couldn't read really English that well, I was using those diagrams with the help from the librarian, I was able to get some understanding how I can be able to generate electricity. So after I managed doing this during my movement, I didn't stop going to the library. One day when I went there, the librarian asked me, why do you always check out the same book? I explained to her that the book helped me to view the movement to generate electricity at home. She was very really interested. So she came to see the movement and she went back. Two weeks later, the people who read the book in the library, they were also like this. They saw the movie and they were interested. They came back with some journalists. Then they wrote an article about that. That article was picked up by one of them that was organizing the tech conference, which was held in Arusha, Tanzania. So I was invited to attend the conference in Arusha, Tanzania in 2007. When I went there, a lot of people came up to me, how can we help you? I said, I want to continue with my studies and I also want to continue with uh, building more windows, especially when you 
for and for those words of inspiration. While commencement is obviously focused on these graduates, occasionally there is a moment so significant that we must pause and recognize an additional adult. And we do this today by offering an honorary Berwick Academy degree to one of our teachers who will also be graduating today after 35 years of service to this community. Many of us have given chunks of time to this place, but very few can say they have given their own time. Today's oldest graduate is known throughout our community for being a teacher of writing above all else. In fact, she often reminds me that she used to teach in my office. And occasionally she notes my nasty grammatical habits that get me into trouble, like my obsession with the hyphen. Look, Jen, I just did it again. More importantly, she's been known as a lover and believer to middle school children. Like a cherished gatekeeper to the upper school, one needs to meet her approval before entering the hallways of the fog. And while her craft as a teacher has been compelling, so too has her passion as a humanitarian. Many times, she's connected us to causes and organizations and other continents simultaneously opening our view and having an impact on the world. And Berwick Academy will not be the same without our beloved Ms. Miller. Someone of this stature is never replaced, but only revered. And while my tenure here has been but a brief blip in her Berwick career, I feel privileged to be the one to offer her this degree and say thank you on behalf of the many heads of school that came before me. Please join me in offering an honorary degree today to Ms. Janet.
Thank you. 
Rachel Elizabeth Hall.
Elizabeth McDonald Wright.
Yeah. 